Um, so the fun thing, I, the first two times I get to introduce our speaker, I read from the script. The third time I just get to, just get to talk a little bit. And so I want to say thank you, Jeff and Angie, for being here these last few days. Um, you've been a, a great gift of God to me personally, which means you've been a gift to my life, my marriage, my family. And um, I know you've been a gift to our department in ways that will carry on for a long time. I'm, I'm confident of that. And you've been a gift to us here at the school as a whole through your presence, through your conversations, through your life and witness. So thank you for that. Um, for those of you who have not been here the last um, couple of services, Jeff and his wife Angie, they have served the Lord faithfully for decades in South Asia um, and back here in the U.S. And now they're actually in Greece um, as kind of a hub for work that they're joining God at work in the Middle East and Central Asia. And um, there's something really amazing that happens when we go out and join God in what he's doing, and God does amazing stuff. And um, Jeff and Angie have lived, lived a life like that, and we're excited to hear um, more from you today. And just want again, thank you for being with us the last few days, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we've um, really enjoyed being here with you guys. Um, it's been a real blessing. Um, still feel very um, humbled. You can tell my voice is getting a little weak, but um, I'm, I'm missing my little swarm team that runs with us. But um, uh, and I've been uh, a lot of friends have been been asking me about uh, Asbury, you know, and the, the what God's doing there. And in all honesty, you know, I don't know <laughs> in in a lot of ways. But I had a a friend of mine who's associated with it write some things that were. Um, very positive of what he's experienced. Um, I sort of come from the Baptist world, so it doesn't quite fit in our genre, where I'm from in Booger Holler. But um, in the last couple of weeks, a couple of the local churches that we've worked with for years, um, one of the little country churches, they had a little girl go down who was experiencing some seizures, and she went down with some friends, and that uh, day, about three people came into the kingdom. The next week, seven people came into the kingdom, and a church service went on for about three hours. And then one of our other friends that uh, he and I were youth pastors together way back in the day, and now he's a pastor of this church, and they had some extended services and people coming to faith. And, um, and, and, and I, don't, you know, I don't really know what to say, but one of the brothers asked me, what, what, what do you think? And I said, well, I'll tell you the one thing I know for sure. I said, go make disciples. Grab those new believers and train them. Give them the identity to be a disciple maker. And let's go out in the community and make disciples. Because what leads to awakenings that last or revivals that last is disciple makings that leads to churches, planting churches. Because if we go back to um, uh, George Whitfield sharing the gospel in the nor Northeast, and uh, he meets this guy named Shubal Stearns, and Shubal Stearns hears the gospel of Jesus Christ, and his life is radically changed. And, and then his brother in law, Marshall, also um, comes to faith. They go to Virginia and they plant a church in Virginia. and. From Virginia, they go down to a place in Sandy Run um, that and they plant a church and it plants a church and plants a church. And I think that was 1742. By 1771, Schubel Stearns dies. Uh, there's 42 churches, daughters, granddaughters, so on and so forth. They also set off the Revolutionary War because um, the Battle of Alamance came out of that. But out of that basically um, began a move of God. And by um, 1800, Baker, uh, one of the historians will say 668 churches, I think, came out of that. Another guy says 1,000. I don't know. Either way, I, you know, if God's doing something unique in that time with Asbury, he's doing something time unique there, the key is we have to embrace, we need to figure out how to make disciples in this nation and we got to embrace that as pursue it and fail forward. Don't be afraid. You know, let's make mistakes um, in the kingdom as far as our God is so forgiving, so loving, so caring. And man, you're, you're not going to make a mistake trying to obey him and love him. Um, he, he honors that. And um, uh, one of the things um, we're going to sort of wrap up today is um, I'm going to... 
I, I was feeling a little bit like Eutychus last night, except I was the guy speaking, and I was afraid I was going to fall out the door or fall out the window. Um, it was, I realized, man, it's 3 a.m. in Greece. Um, and uh, so I wanted to backtrack a little bit um, from last night, but it ties really well in today. And um, this is just some of the basic things we teach you. If you recognize, this is actually Acts chapter 2, uh, 37 through uh, 47. You know, and I think my favorite part of Acts 2, 37 through 47, is there's a little promise in there someday for the generations. And so right then, all those people come into faith, that, that fruition, that time where Jesus has prayed, I think, over Peter, saying, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it, as long as it brings glory and honor to me. And um, Peter, you're going to do greater things than I myself. And just, I know we can't top saving the world and the, the hope that's within Christ, but this idea and the humility of our Lord and Savior had a desire that disciple makers would help other disciple makers do greater things for the kingdom of God. That, as John said, I must decrease, he must increase. And so to think in that promise that there's a, a promise for my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, not only physically but spiritually, gives me great hope um, cause I, I just, I still go back to the first day is thinking every one and a half seconds, somebody dies and goes to an eternity in South Asia and never hears the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that burdens me cause the little town we live near in Shelby, North Carolina is 38,000 people. And to realize every single day, Shelby, North Carolina gets wiped off the map blows me away. And to think maybe every 10 days or so, um, Angie and I have managed to be in good places at bad times. So we decided to be in Thailand uh, during the tsunami. Um, just to, you know, I guess I'm not sure why, but we tried really hard to be in the middle of it. God protected us in the middle of that. But that day, 220,000 people gone. And just to realize that happens day in, day out in South Asia. And I remember the tsunami, it was on the news forever. We think about the earthquake that just happened in Turkey and how many people lost their lives. And it's, it's on the news, but it'll wane. But day in, day out around the globe, people die and go in eternity and it never makes the news. Nobody thinks about it. There's nobody praying for it. Um, but we have to take this to the Lord because this is his heart that these people around the globe come into the kingdom. That's why he's slow, so slow about his, his promise because he desires people to repent everywhere. And so I, I, just, I, I just love that promise in Acts chapter two. And so this is just some of the basic things we teach new believers through, we were talking yesterday, the three-thirds process where we're, man, we're, we're loving one another, we're sitting around having a meal, we're talking about our highs and lows, and praying, encouraging one another. We're checking, man, how are we doing at making disciples? How are we doing growing in Christ-likeness? How are we doing at going out to share the gospel? Um, I got my little hand signals for all this because I'm used to working with illiterates, so sorry. I know y'all are super educated, but it helps me remember. And then we, we worship together. In some places, um, man, I, I love to get to worship like this, um, but man, a lot of times we're sitting around and none of us know how to sing and we're bad singers. I don't know if you ever heard first generation new believers from like a Muslim background try and sing and like, it's awful. You know, let's, let's read Psalm 67, guys, and just pray back to Jesus, because we, we need to stop singing. And I don't help the band at all, trust me. Um, this is not my sweet spot. So I love to get to experience that. Most of the time, though, man, I'm sitting in a spot and just going, ooh, boy, just, uh, it's a joyful noise. Praise God. That's it. <laughs> so we're worshiping. Then we're, we're reminding ourselves of that vision, the vision to get to the nations, the vision Every one and a half seconds, somebody dies and goes in eternity, but they need to hear about Jesus. And God, in his infinite wisdom, chose us to be his instruments to proclaim the gospel. 
It's his gospel, and his gospel's powerful. You know, Isaiah 55, 11 says, the word of God will not return void until it accomplishes his purpose, right? It will not return void. It will accomplish its purpose. There's never, you know, we always say, I can have the most perfect gospel presentation, and it just sort of falls on deaf ears. And then you see this, you know, you, you, the day you get up and you go, man, I'm feeling awful, and you share, and, and, you, and, it, and, and God uses it. And you're like, wow, well, it's not about me. It's all about him. It's all about his glory. It's all about his honor. Yes, I want to study to show myself approved. Yes, I want to do the best I can do to share the gospel. But what he's looking for is willing vessels who will go and take a risk for the kingdom and have um, a couple seconds of his sanity to say, yes, I will obey Jesus. Then in that middle third, we look in the word of God and we begin to learn, what do we learn about God? What do we learn about man? Is there a sin to obey, command to um, obey, sin to avoid, command to obey? Um, There's my dyslexia kicking in. So, and then we look forward and, you know, the one piece that uh, is very awkward for Americans, um, one of the pieces we do is practice. And so you guys go to the gym, you know, and, and you're hammering in the gym. You teach your kids to play baseball, soccer, football. But one of the key things in training and making disciples is practice. I work with a lot of illiterates, so a lot of times when we share the Word of God, we're going to share the story. We're going to share the story again, share the story again. We usually share it about five times to help them put it and hide it in their hearts so that week they can go back and share that story with somebody. Because I, I did a survey one time with the IMB when we were looking at a movement and there were 95% of the people were illiterate and 98% of the people in the movement carried a Bible. You know, I mean, because, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm talking to these guys and they, they know 5, 10, 15, 25 stories from the Word of God and they got a Bible and they can't read it. But it's precious to them. And every one of them is trying to learn how to read and they want to learn how to read because the Word of God is precious to them because it's changed their lives. And so I got to make sure I do the practice with them. But a lot of times as Westerners, we feel very awkward with practice but it's so key for, it's not for you, it's for that new believer. They need this practice as we do this. And then we set our goals for the next week. Man, who am I gonna share with? How much am I, am I gonna prayer walk? How am I gonna obey Jesus this week? What should be changed and transformed in my life? And we pray and commission one another. That's just one model of disciple making. Um, we've been using it since, uh, I think 2002 or three, I, I asked David Garrison, who was my boss at the time, I said, man, I want to go learn more about movements. And I'd just come back from this thing in Orissa, and he sent me down to Thailand, and I got to meet this guy named Ying Kai, and, and he, he taught about this. And I was like, wow, I, I can't use that piece, because that's not going to work here, because all this written stuff, because we're literate where we're at. But this piece here, this three-thirds, Man, I'm going to go back to my race car back home, jack it up, pull the engine out. I'm going to put three-thirds under the hood. And so my kids actually grew up in a home uh, leading three-thirds, and we would always take turns. And so my little one, Miriam, when she was little, now she's married and living in Egypt and a missionary and has a kid, but she was like, I want to lead. And so she would, at a very young age, lead. At a very young age, she was preaching the gospel to some of our friends that were Buddhists that she loved very much. And she would, it was funny, she'd get out there and she'd point at the idols and she says, your idol he has ears he can't hear, he has eyes he can't see, his hands can't move, you must repent. You know, three-year-old, so. But, uh, you know, and, and then, you, then you challenge them, why don't you go over and spend two years overseas, and guess what they do. And so, we were, um, I love to ride motorcycles. Um, there's two reasons I love to ride motorcycles. One, I got a GPS that's built in right here. I know where every hamburger joint is on every corner there is across the coast, and, and it loves brisket too, so it's, it's, it's shaking right now. There's, I'm in brisket territory. And so we'll get out on the motorcycles and ride, and it's one of my ways to just hang out. But we were sharing the gospel with a brother um, named Smokey, 
and uh, Smokey came to faith, and he'd been an old one percenter biker, which just means they're the bad guy bikers, okay? But he met Jesus, now he's in the 99, he's in the good side. And um, I remember he was coming to our little church that was, um, we were meeting in his garage and we were meeting in our home and his daughter was nine years old. And um, maybe about the third time she came, she's sort of looking at this whole process. We're, we're taking them through what we call the commands of Jesus. And she's watching this three thirds and she's like, can I lead church next week? I said, yeah, you can. I said, can we practice with you this week how to do it? And that little girl came back the next week and led all the three-thirds process. She shared the story, and then she said, and she, so she shared the story two or three times, and then she said, now, bear up, and you guys tell the story. Now, let's tell the story together. Now, what do you learn about God? What do you learn about man? Is there a sin to avoid? Is there a command to obey? All right, one more time practicing, and she just went right through it. And God just, this, this little girl is like, I can do this. And then this little girl, along with my little girl, they're wanting to start groups in the middle school. She's in elementary school, but the other one, my daughter's in middle school, and they're wanting to start these groups. It's like, yes, go for it, you know? And so God has been using this. It's, it's very effective. Um, again, this pattern exists in a lot of disciple-making things, but I wanted to point this out last night, and, and I forgot about well, like I said, I was about to be Eutychus and fall over dead, um, and I wasn't so sure you guys would revive me or not. So, um, so we, we call it, this is the Acts 2 piece, and we, basically this is where Dr. George Patterson um, basically came up with what they call the commands of Christ. And so um, the commands of Christ is basically you repent and believe. So there's always this constant repentance in our lives. The one time for when we met Jesus, but the other time is there always ought to be a constant repentance in my life. There should never be an option for me not to be in a period of repentance. And then he tells us to be baptized in that passage, there were 3,000 people baptized on that day, and they sat devoted to the apostles' teachings, so they were centered around the Word of God. There with some leaders, and you'll see a little guy with a shepherd's hook there, and um, we know they were doing the Lord's Supper in the church. Um, they were giving time and money and effort in the church. It says there was koinonia fellowship. They were loving one another, caring for one another. They're praying in the church. They're um, worshiping and they're multiplying. And if we watch and walk through the scriptures, you can see this clear thing, I think, of what we talked about yesterday with Peter's life. I think Paul actually imitates and follows exactly what Jesus did. And we call it Paul's journeys. I've convinced now it's the we journeys because the more I look at it, it's a group of people making decisions based on what the Holy Spirit's leading and guiding them. And Paul probably makes a lot of the decisions, but they're all agreeing, this is what we're going to do. This is what the body of Christ will do. And so when we take on the identity of a disciple maker, the identity of Christ, and we begin to model and we do this as a group, what we want to do, and this is where you can't separate identity and obedience. We must obey Jesus, and it's a desire. And so um, recently, uh, recently, two, March 21st, uh, when COVID hit, I don't know where you were, but I was, I was in India, and I heard on the 20th about this COVID thing, and I was just like, okay, this sounds bad. And then we get a notification from the Indian government that says, uh, tomorrow all airplane flights cease. And I live in Greece, my wife's in America, and I'm like, uh, Jeff won't live long without mama. So I'm getting on an airplane. So I, I had the freedom to do that. And so I got the last flight out of India. And then for the next several years, we were stuck away from our home in Greece. We were just beginning to see this multiplication really start to occur among the refugees in Greece. We were struggling to get to church, in all honesty. We, we, they don't stay long enough. They, they come to faith, we get them discipling, and they start multiplying, and about the time you gather church, they're headed to the promised land. The promised land's called Germany, because everybody, nobody wants to stay in Greece. I, I love Greece. 
I know we got another sister in here who loves Greece, but my brothers who are coming from the smoke and fire where all the bad stuff's going on, they want to go to Germany, and that's their hope. And so during COVID, we had about 200 Muslim background believers move to Germany. And so we come back, and we're, we're trying to figure out, what do we do? And I felt a little bit like I was like, okay, we need to go to Crete and set in order the church. Um, cause we got all these scattered believers now and they're in disarray and we got to go back and rechange, retrain them and revive them. And so we made our first trip a couple weeks ago to Germany and we went to Hanover. I managed to get two speeding tickets on the Audubon. One of them I didn't do. The other one was my fault, but they're tricky. They give this unlimited speed limit and then they throw up an 80 kilometer an hour, which is like 40 mile an hour. I'm like, what the heck? So anyhow, we got two tickets. It was an expensive trip. Um, I won't rent a car again, but so we go into Hanover and we're meeting with our brothers. And so I'm talking to Masood and so Masood, um, just catching up. And, and so he's sharing a story how he led two Kurdish families to Christ and he was beginning to disciple them. And I was like, man, praise God, brother. I said, did, um, did you baptize them already? He said, no, no, we didn't baptize them. I said, when did you lead them to Christ? He said, oh, maybe two, three months ago. I said, why in the world have you not baptized them yet? I said, let's go look at the word of God. So we pulled out the word of God and went in and looked at the baptism. I said, why haven't you, why haven't you obeyed the command? It says, it doesn't say to be baptized. What's it say? Baptize. The command is to be a baptizer. And so I I said, Masood, why haven't you baptized? He said, well, I'm afraid in Germany, maybe it's illegal. There's some problem. I said, brother, first of all, it's not illegal. Um, Second of all, the commands of God come above the laws of the land, period. We will not neglect sharing the gospel. We will not neglect baptizing. We will not neglect the commands of God for any law in any land in any place. There are things that we do need to definitely do. I'm going to pay my taxes. I'm going to honor the speed limit next time. Try. (laughs) I couldn't actually see the signs. Um, I'm blind at night. And so Masood said, brother, I am sorry. I I will go back and baptize them. And so then we were talking some more and and so I, I said, well, let's pull out the, this, this diagram here and walk through it. I said, are you guys doing this? Are you guys loving one another, caring for another? It was really obvious they were. Um, I let the guys set the schedule. It was um, a bunch of Arab brothers that also have GPSs, but they're just sort of set on like Kurdish time or Iraqi time. I don't know. And so we get up late, and then they cook a big meal, and then we start our training late, and then we eat again, and then we train, and then it's 3 a.m. and we go to bed and we do the same thing all over again. So I'm, it's making me nuts, but I'm like, this, brothers, this is your thing. This is your house. This is what you're going to do. So we're walking through this, and, I, and we got to the Lord's Supper. I said, have you guys done the Lord's Supper? He said, no, we haven't done the Lord's Supper in about two years. I said, why? Have you not done the Lord's Supper? Well, we weren't sure if we could. I said, is this your church? Yes. Is this not something that Jesus commanded? He's like, yes. I said, all right. Luke 22, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we did a study on it. We did the three-thirds gathering and said, all right, guys. And we did the Lord's Supper. Now, the funny thing is my, my brother Masood, he's a little, um, uh, he's funny. So it's 11 o'clock at night in Hanover, this little, it's outside of Hanover. It's in a little village. So we're looking for something red. And we cannot find anything red. So, and, and wine was not an option. So we, so we go find some, I think, raspberry something. And he's like, that's not red enough. It doesn't look like the blood of Jesus. I'm like, brother, you ain't done it in two years. What's the matter? Let's just, anything. And so, so we took tea and put in, we put red tea inside of it. And tried, it was nasty. Um, <laughs> And so, but anyhow, we, we did the Lord's Supper with about 13 uh, Kurdish and Arab brothers there. And we walked away and, and, and Danny, who's become a really good friend of mine and I love so much. He's part of the, one of the guys I spend 60 to 90 days a year with. And he's had incredible trauma in his life of um, his father was killed by the Iranians and he's been imprisoned and beaten and 
Um, he's, but he's very little a apostolic. So y'all hear me. I'm not saying big a apostolic. I'm saying little, he's a missionary type. He doesn't think about inside the church. He thinks about outside the church. This guy wants to reach all of North Africa. This guy wants to reach all of Northern chunk or the Southern chunk of the Mediterranean looking down at North Africa. I mean, he just has a missionary heart and it's so clear. Um, but he's wounded, he's hurt. And so he makes me a little crazy at times, but he looks like John Belushi. If any of y'all know who he is, y'all are probably too young, but, um, and he's just as funny. He's a really funny guy. And I think the first time I met him, I said, man, this, he and I are going to be friends for life. And so I love him, but he's also got a built-in GPS. I can trust his GPS. Usually if we're in a city and he points something out, I'm like, yeah, your GPS is good. If, if it's down and he's in Spain, I know, okay, it, GPS does not work in Spain. Um, it's not possible. They need to import jalapenos, I think, something. I need spice with my food. But Danny walked away and he said, we can do this all over Germany. I said, brother, you're right. And because we have 200 Muslim background believers scattered. And what if we can gather them and train and equip them and basically like Crete, reorganize the church. And so this happened and the brothers walked away going, we can do this. And so Rial's in his car now driving across Germany, gathering believers and organizing them into churches across Germany. And then getting them to start focusing on those million plus Muslims that are scattered all over Germany that needed to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then when the earthquake happened, I called the brothers. I said, man, how many of y'all's families were affected? And so, and they're, they're in a really bad spot where it no-go zone. And so they're talking, yeah, they're sleeping outside. The house was destroyed. This happened. This brother's um, daughter was killed. And so... At the same time, as they're focusing here, these brothers have a, such a heart to get back to their nation. And they can't go. But they're, they're helping our brothers that are a little south of there go over there and help and reach out into these places that I can't go. But the brothers around them love these brothers. And so God's been using this. And so one of the dreams and visions we have is, can God use these crises where there's smoke and fire and there's 300 million people on the move, can God use those to multiply disciples and multiply churches? And right now, I, I'll say it's been discouraging the last two years during COVID um, and before COVID, and, but we're encouraged right now because we're starting to beginning to see, man, I think we're going to see about seven um, MBB churches in Portugal, probably seven in Germany this year, just where the gatherings are and just thinking, wow, this, this is the, this is where we wanted to be right before COVID. And we could have been, but COVID happened. And now just excited to see that God's establishing his church here. Um, I just want to say a, a little bit about, um, the, uh, I'm going to go back to this piece. Um, you know, I sort of separated them, but the truth is you cannot separate identity from obedience. You can't separate identity growing in Christ likeness for the, without having modeling and modeling without obedience. Because right in the middle, we always say simple biblical reproducing. I need to ha put some things in brothers and sisters' hands that are simple biblical and reproducing. Now, what I'm not saying is... You know, at one time somebody rebuked me because I said the gospel's simple. Now, I believe the gospel's simple, but I also think the gospel is unsearchable, unimaginable. I can't explain the gospel. So there's one thing. Can, can a man or woman simply respond to the gospel? And I would say yes. But can you fully ever understand the gospel in all your life? I don't think so. I mean, the depths are amazing and the richness are amazing in the work of Christ. So we just say, man, we want to create a sticky ball of learning. And all I'm trying to promote here is a sticky ball of learning. Let's just start real simple and we keep growing and growing and this, this sticky ball just grows like a snowball. And God can use that if we start right there. Where if we give you the whole bale of hay, 
Um, you might choke on the whole bale of hay, all right? That's country speaking, right? Um, instead, we're just going to start real simple. But I, I have to say, all of this is going on at the same time. It's, it's you can't isolate them. And uh, you guys are familiar. I've been listening to Brian quote this passage over and over again. But um, I'm going to read it. And... I got my large print here. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a sensible man who builds his house on a rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded the house, yet it didn't collapse because the foundation was built on the rock. But everyone who hears the words of mine and doesn't act on them will be a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, winds blew, and it collapsed. And so I say all that to say, Jesus said, if we keep his commands, it demonstrates we love him. If we keep his commands and demonstrate we love him, it demonstrates we love the Father. If we keep his command to love one another, uh, John 17, it says it proves, it's, it's a demonstration that Jesus Christ is Lord and God as the brothers and sisters in Christ love one another. And we talked about this command of loving God, loving our neighbor at the very beginning and making disciples. But Jesus gave some very specific commands. Now, a lot of times people go, oh, you know, you're going you're to get into legalism, Jeff. You're talking about commands. And I, I want to say obeying Jesus and you guys are amazing singers. Um, I'm not. <laughs> you wouldn't want me up here singing. I, I would probably mess you up if I was up here singing. But you know what? I can worship God right out there by loving my neighbor. You know, that's worship. I can pick up a hammer and put a door on somebody's house and love them. And if I do it, it can be worship. I can share a Bible story with somebody far from God, and I'm worshiping Jesus. I can go to a brother and say, I messed up. Will you forgive me? And I'm worshiping Jesus. You guys encouraged me by your encouragement with what we're going through right now with our, our son. And, and just, man, that, was, that wasn't only loving me. Guess what? That's worship. I would love for you to just reorient that obeying Jesus is worship. It's glorious. It's amazing. To obey his commands is worship. It's not a hardship. You know, it, 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 you know it's, uh, I, I would love today to finish with Acts chapter 4, you know, and when Peter comes back after prison and he's, he's coming back to the, um, this group of people who are praying and they begin to tell him everything that God's done. And they, they pray this beautiful prayer. You know, and in the prayer, basically what you see is they're emboldened. And so we've been praying this Acts 4.23 to the end of the chapter in a lot of our churches across North Africa and Middle East and Central Asia that we would be emboldened to share the gospel. And boldly sharing the gospel is not a drudgery. It's not a, it's a privilege. It's worship. When somebody rejects you know, a lot of times we, we add another list. Um, I know we was talking to a brother in Pakistan. We, have a, we add another piece on our accountability. We talk about checking on sharing the gospel. We check on who's been making disciples. But the third one we check is who got rejected this week, who got their face slapped, who got accosted, who physically got beaten. And so many times there was more numbers in Pakistan related to those pieces. But guess what? It's worship. Obedience is worship. So as, as we talk about um, the commands that God's uh, given us, man, they are just purely, beautifully worship. I was telling you guys about Hussein and Hussein coming to faith, and we were, we were probably on about the seventh time this brother had been in prison, beaten. Um, the last time they got him, they put a thing over his face and put a gun in his mouth and then they beat him and he woke up in a hospital. We didn't hear from him for about 15 days. He'd been unconscious three days. 
and lost his phone, lost everything. And, and, and you can see some of the, just like, okay, I'm getting tired of this. Um, I'm, I'm getting weary of this. This brother's tired of it. And um, so I called a friend up and, um, and, and, uh, and, and we've, we've run into each other occasionally, but I knew he had a lot more experience than I did in this situation. I said, what do you do? What, what do we need to adjust? And so he, for the next two hours and 45 minutes, um, he just talked at me, I would say. He lectured me. And, and we always teach, we want to love God, love our neighbor, love our enemies. He said, add a command in to forgive your enemies. He said, start publicly forgiving your enemies right as this happened. And so we began to add this into our story set of what we were teaching Hussein and the people that were multiplying, and it began to change their hearts. But what was fascinating, because my brother's point was, he said, in Islam, there is no forgiveness like this. And when you're demonstrating and modeling this, he said, it rocks their world. And so we've begun to see that just this pure forgiveness is rattling them. That, okay, you just beat this guy up and he, he, he forgives you and he loves you. And just instilling this into the brothers. Now, I, I don't know that I would know how to do that. God has given these guys a lot of grace and mercy to be able to do that. But all I'm saying is, I was showing you a set of commands that there were in Acts 2, but man, we adjust as we're seeing the situations, and that we don't always do everything the same. When we're in Nepal, we would use the command for repent and believe. We'd use the story of the demoniac, because one of the first words they'd learn in Nepal is, if you're not good, the demon will get you. So I'm dealing with power encounters, so I'm going to adjust my stories for the sake of discipleship. I'm still teaching the command to repent and believe, but I'm fighting a different battle in, the, in this, this kingdom piece here. Because remember, we're trying, here's the world, here's the kingdom of God, and we're trying to realign with the kingdom of God. And so we're adjusting as we go. Um, we were uh, teaching um, on baptism here recently, I, well, let me say this summer. And so we were teaching this lesson on baptism and I don't know how many teams, I, I've seen it happen here even in Dallas. So we're teaching it and this lady comes up to me and she said, she said, I repented and believed in Jesus about four weeks ago. And she said, I am convicted, I have to be baptized. And I said, well, okay, well, you need to talk to your pastor and leaders here because you're, you're out of my control here, but why don't you go talk to them? And I had just taught Mark 7 right before the baptism lesson. And so she went over to her pastor and she said, um, hey, the Bible says that I'm supposed to be baptized. And this is a command from God. Do I obey you or do I obey the word of God? And so I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> So anyhow, so the pastor agreed she needed to be baptized. Um, but then she came up, actually before she was baptized uh, that day, uh, she came up and she's from a very difficult, a very challenging area to live. And, and she was sharing that when she came to faith, uh, she would have been wearing a burqa. And she, when she met Jesus, she took the burqa off and her husband was giving her a hard time. And, and she husband's like, hey, you got to put that back on. You need to, you're bringing shame to me. And she handed them the burqa and said, hey, if you like it so well, you wear it. Um, so anyhow, she's planted a church now in this very difficult area. She got baptized and she baptized her two uh, daughters. Her husband since then um, is getting very close to meeting Jesus. And their son is just about in the kingdom also. So God's bringing this family together. But you know what? I, I, I watched that day and just, man, it was a beautiful piece of worship. It wasn't, it wasn't legalism. Man, she, she just, she wanted to honor the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And it was deep in her heart that like, I've got to do this. And you could just see the worship in her heart. And it was just such an amazing thing to watch that interaction, very strong interaction with a lady, with a pastor um, that isn't normally in that context. But just to see, I've got to do this. Um, 
And so God uses this obedience in people. And um, I, uh, um, I shared this one with you, and I, wanna, I just want to share it again. It's probably my, one of my favorite scriptures that has just come to mean so much more, I don't know, just so much to me. I assure you the one who believes in me will also do works that I do. He will do even greater works than these because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do. If so, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. And so, I, I, I just think this ought to be the posture of a disciple maker, is our desire, is those that God's given us that stewardship over, we're expecting and hoping they do greater things that we could even imagine. And so I, I just, I, I just, there was a brother, um, you know, I shared the Peter story yesterday, and there's a brother named Dorje, and I had two Dorjes in my life, and um, Dorje, they were both, one was 57, one was 67, but Dorje, who was 67, when we went to leave, we would, we would come over, and, and I would talk about these illiterate, untrained men, and we were teaching Bible stories. We'd teach Bible stories, and Dorje would go, and teach Bible stories, and Dorje would go, and they'd go in and out of Bhutan. And Dorje ended up um, winning his family to Christ, and his churches began to multiply over the next seven years, and he saw generations of churches um, come. He was key in the Bible translation. God used this, but he was illiterate, carried his Bible everywhere he went. And, and I remember when we were, we were leaving in 2009, and God was calling us back. And I remember Dorje coming to me, and he said, he was telling me that I was his hero. And I'm like, oh, dude, like you're my hero. But he said, you showed me that illiterate, untrained men can turn the world upside down. I said, brother, that's the word of God. That's what the word of God says is illiterate, untrained men turn the world upside down. And God, this brother didn't just go to Bhutan. He went up into China reaching the Mumpan. He went up into these ethnic Tibetan areas doing his business of yak trading and, and buying and selling and on the way planting churches and sharing the gospel. And we, we call them horse churches, not house churches because they were semi-nomadic people. So their church never stayed in the same spot. But I, I, just, I just want you to, to realize it's not how educated you are. It's not how bright you are. It's not how charismatic you are. It doesn't matter whether you're, um, you know, an extrovert or an introvert. What matters is are you willing to just obey Jesus and to realize that it is, it's pure worship. Um, I, was, I was sharing earlier that Man, one of the beautiful things, you know, I get to ride my motorcycle when we go up to Corinth often, and, and, and my wife can give you a PhD level tour of Corinth, I promise you. She's, she has got Corinth down to a deep level. And so a lot of times we bring leaders in and we, we will spend five days in the Word of God going through the Word and we'll look at Acts and usually what we do is we'll look at a church plant in the book of Acts and then we'll look at how did Paul get them to a healthy church and what was the battle that ensued. And um, so when we were, when we're there... Um, one of the things you'll run into as you're going through Corinthians or reading Corinthians is you hit chapter 11 and you, you hit this piece where it's talking about, you know, women, cover your heads. And, and, and when you're in that context, um, you know, in the context today, it's, it's either a form of legalism or um, we just sort of go, oh, well, I don't know what to do with that, so I'm not going to touch it. And... Um, you know, what's interesting is some of the people who were coming to faith then were prostitutes. And in that time, prostitutes had to shave their head. The boys and girls' heads were shaved. So you could identify who the prostitutes were in Corinth. Well, just imagine now, you've, you've met Jesus. Uh, you're in the local church, and you have these beautiful Corinthian ladies around you with this long, beautiful hair. And, and, and you're a, a, a young girl who just met Jesus 
and you're in that church and you're feeling ashamed and you're, you're, you're struggling with, and I don't, I don't look like her. I don't feel like her. I don't, I don't I feel out of place. And so, you know, Paul in his wisdom, I think he went back to the command, love your neighbor. I don't think he instituted legalism. I think he instituted love your neighbor. And he said to the ladies in Corinth, if you love these little girls, would you please cover your heads and let that hair grow out that's supposed to adorn them. And it's this beautiful thing that God's given them. And because the other thing he says, if you're not willing to do that, why don't you shave your head to identify with her? I really think if I were to say, you know, and I think chapter 13 would obviously hit that, but Paul many times when he's going dealing with a problem, especially you think about 1st, 2nd Corinthians, he is going back to one of the commands of Jesus and he's saying, man, if you love these little girls, would you do this for a season till they feel part of the community, till they feel like they're loved and cared for. And, and so I, I, want, want, I just want to say this, the, the only way, what's the only way to make a command of Jesus legalism? It's to add something to it, isn't it? Man adds something to it. Just like we looked in Mark chapter seven, the traditions of man started to be risen above the word of God. And so in disciple making, don't do that. Allow the freedom of the spirit to work through the commands of Jesus. Because have you ever, you know, a command is to forgive, right? Have you ever forgiven too much? Have you ever repented too much? Did you, you know, I got home last night. It's like, you know what? I just loved too much yesterday. I blew it. I, I just, I mean, honestly, if you just, you know, now a friend of mine, he gave me a hard time. Um, I got a comeback for him now. He, he said, now Jesus commanded to kiss each other on the cheek. And I said, well, I lived in Lebanon for two years. I kissed a lot of bearded men on their cheeks and they kissed me too. So I understand the command now a little better, but the essence of that command for each one of us is we, we can't add anything to this. We have to. Just take the command for it, what it is, and allow the word and the spirit to work as the body of Christ works together. Because we, what, what, where's, where is the classroom? It's out there. And what, who are we going to do it with? Some friends, community, right? And we're going to take that identity and we're going to go and model for one another or get modeled from. And we want to learn to obey Jesus in the community, not just making converts. We talked at the very beginning. The goal isn't to make a convert. The goal is what? To make disciples that grow in the likeness of Christ. But the great thing is Christ is the one who transforms and changes. We just get to be the delivery boy with the word of God and to partner with him and just watch him work. And God's amazing in that. And um, I'm going to skip ahead. And um, sorry, I wanted to I wanted to hit this. But um, I, I, when I when we were first before we did the commands of Jesus, I was doing Hebrews six one and two is what we teach for short term discipleship. After that, we would teach a meta narrative, and we'd teach about thirty five lessons on creation to culmination. And, um, you know, one of the things that always bugged me when I'd look in um, chapter uh, 5 of Hebrews, I think it's 12 and 13, um, he, he, it, I don't know who you think wrote Hebrews, we all got our opinions, but um, I won't betray myself, but it says that you are still, you know, drinking milk. You guys here in Hebrews, you know, here in Jerusalem, you're still drinking milk and it's time that you should be on the meat. Well, to me, that just sounds pretty simple. You know, we just go from milk to meat, right? Well, one of the things I realized after I started doing this is guess what? There's a lot of mess in the middle. So you got to disciple the mess out of them. It doesn't go milk to meat. I wish it, I just wish it sort of went like this. 
It's just like the church. I wish the church grew just like this. But you know how discipleship goes? It's like this. And then like this. And you know, it's, it's messy. But that mess is sanctifying me and sanctifying them because I'm growing in the middle of the mess, learning sometimes patience, sometimes perseverance, sometimes as I'm helping a brother grow in character, the Holy Spirit's using it to help grow my character. And so I I don't want you to go think, man, this is all just going to be real easy, man. We got some methodology, some tool. It is not that way. If you think it's that way, I guarantee you more mess than you'll ever can imagine. There is mess in the middle of this. And so what we want to do is, it's, it's like getting somebody, you know, I, I don't, I think what God does with the commands is it's like training wheels. He wants to get us started with some simple things. And what's really good is to have a brother or sister come along beside me and help me learn the training wheels of man repenting and believing and baptism and loving and prayer, you know, praying those simple prayers, learning to love one another, learning to love my enemies, learning all these simple basic commands because, you know, just like I'm watching my grandchildren just start to learn. Um, They're using a knife and fork. You think using a knife and fork would look pretty good. Um, But what I look down is underneath the table, there's a big mess. And it takes a while to learn how to operate that knife and fork. And it's the same way as we begin to disciple as they're growing in their identity to Christ, as we're modeling how to use that knife and fork, um, man, there's going to be mess. But I, I think, because one of the things I always ask myself is I sit here and I look at Corinth and Paul was there for a year and a half. Before that, he'd really been most places two to four months. He was in Ephesus three years, Corinth a year and a half. And you would think time would make the, a big difference, right? And, and I do think time, but I think what's really key is rapid obedience, not rapid results. It's the more rapidly we begin to obey the commands of Jesus and we begin to love him and grow in that Christ likeness. God desires that. But you realize by time Titus wrote back about Corinth and before they went from milk to meat, the mess in the middle took seven years. Seven years. There was a mess in the middle. Don't expect anything different. I, 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 it's, it's just, it's what God does through his grace. It's what he does through his mercy because he loves and cares. He wants us to grow in that Christ likeness. But I'm telling you, it's so good for me to be involved in the mess and to walk with them through this. And I want to promise you, it's good for you. It's going to grow you. It's going to sanctify you. It's going to change your life. And and in the end, man, I have friends now for life in, in Nepal and India and America, all because of disciple making. And they're not only friends, they're family now. I mean, they're a family that we have One I call a son, Ray, that we talked about. Their family, it's rich in our lives. And so I I just want to challenge you. Are you willing to take a risk and go out and rediscover how to make disciples? And are you willing to go on the streets and do it and do it with a group of friends? And you don't have to have it all figured out. You, you, You learn what you can. Take what you can, but in the end, man, the word of God and the Holy Spirit is absolutely sufficient, and Christ is glorious, and listen, he's already working out there. I was, let's just share one last thing with Hussein. Hussein, the poor guy's moved seven times. I think he's a one-year-old, one-month-old believer, and so he was going up to a place, and he was out sharing the gospel and um, he met a guy, and this, is, this would be an area where they strap stuff to him and blow themselves up. And so he's sharing the gospel, and this guy goes, hey, I know somebody who needs to hear this. And so this guy went, I mean, all the way across the country to go to this place because he wants to obey Jesus. 
Because one of the things that's ingrained in this brother's heart is he's trying to see a church, a disciple established in all 698 villages and all 60 people groups and language groups. He's one year, one month old in the kingdom. And so he's pursuing this village where there's no believers. And he goes there and a Muslim man says, I know somebody you need to meet. And he meets a lady that had a dream 20 years ago of Jesus. And she says to him, where have you been? I've been waiting to hear about Jesus. And she comes to faith and repents and believes. Now, it doesn't always happen like that, but God's got prepared people. But this guy started out just reaching his household. And now the brother, he, he said confidently recently, said, he said, two and a half, and I'm, I, I was saying five years, but he said in two and a half years, he said, I will have gone to every single village and preached the gospel. And I believe that God's going to be on the way to making sure there's a church in every village. I'm like, brother, you, your faith is greater than mine. That, that's amazing. And so I say that to say, God's already out at work out here. If he's working in this place, he's working here too. Because our God's at work. This is, he is not sleeping. He is awake. He desires all men to repent everywhere because he loves them way more than we do. And he's moving and he's working. He's an active God. And he wants us to be involved. And as we go, it's worship. Can you imagine? It's, it's, it's worship. It's worship. Amen. I'm going to pray for you guys, and man, we've been a real privilege to be here, but uh, let me pray. So, Father, we just, we just praise you. You're King of kings and Lord of lords, and Lord, we, man, we dream of the day and imagine the day when we say, holy, holy is the Lamb, worthy of all praise, glory, and honor. You are glorious. You are amazing. And Father, though we're reminded there's a time that you're coming, that Christ, you're coming as a lion, and you're going to come. And one of the few things that we can do right here through a discipline by obeying and worshiping you is to make disciples. Father, help us. Father, I pray Genesis 12, 1 through 3 over my brothers and sisters. Bless them, they be a blessing to Dallas. Bless them, they be a blessing to our nation. Bless them, they be a blessing to the nations, Father. I pray that you would thrust workers out of this place all over. And we'd be absolutely amazed. We would look back someday and be blown away by what you're doing. And what a privilege we've had to make disciples and to walk with you and experience what you're doing. So Father, bless my brothers and sisters. In Jesus' name, amen.